Shabbat Shalom. There is a great story that I uh, read last week. Um, it was part of an article. Uh, it was a Rav Cook story about Rav Cook, written by uh, a Rabbi Pupko, uh, the younger Rab, Rabbi Pupko, not the one in Chicago, for those who know him. Um, and this is a story that Rav Cook, who was the first chief rabbi of pre-state Israel, of, of Palestine, very respected among both the ultra-Orthodox community he came from, um, but also he reached out. He reached out to secular people. He reached out to the kibbutzniks, to the pioneers. He was known for that. And then one day there was a man who uh, came to talk to him, who was also a rabbinic leader, and started to give him a really hard time for all of his outreach to secular people. He was saying, how can you be so open to all the kibbutzniks, all the secular people? Don't you know what they're doing or what they're not doing? Maybe what they're doing is worse. And he went on and on. And Rav Cook just stayed silent, and he was overlooking a valley in Jerusalem. And at a certain point, the man said, why aren't you answering me? Why aren't you talking to me? You're just looking over the valley. And then Rav Cook, Rav Cook said just quietly, well, it's not as if they're doing what thousands of years ago people were doing in a valley, offering their children up as sacrifices to Moloch. Right? In biblical times, there was a practice, horrible practice, idolatrous, of offering their children to Moloch. And so it's a story the, the Rabbi Pupko, he was saying in the context of his Orthodox community where he comes from, to warn his people that against religious judgment, of people who are less religious and uh, have a measure of compassion. Uh, but I take it also as a story that speaks against inner fanaticism, uh, fanati fanati fanaticism in general. And Rav Cook was saying, okay, they're not keeping the mitzvot, but they deserve such hate and denunciation. So last week there was a uh, Zoom panel uh, about Israel and the situation there. Um, and the journalist, Yossi klein Levy was saying, well, what's happening in Israel right now is this meeting place of zealotry, fanaticism, and political corruption. And the last time this happened was when the temple, uh, second temple was destroyed. But zealotry, but what is, what is zealotry? Well, zealotry is believing that you hold the key to truth and believe that those who don't share your view are unworthy, and then being willing to fight for your narrow truth against all opposition. Truly a plague of our times and, and on every side. And what's the opposite of zealotry and opposite of being of fanaticism? And it's taking a measured approach and trying to understand and being open to others and judging others favorably, letting go of wrongs. And also being realistic about people and their struggles and their failings, our failings, and also our own selves. And so many people make a lot of other people's mistakes, right? We make a mountain out of a molehill out of other people's mistakes, even if they do mostly everything right. But then when it comes to us, we only wish to be judged on everything we do right. And we make a molehill of out of our own mis mountain of mistakes. And so when the rabbis felt they had to create a prayer in the daily Amidah that was rejecting um, heretics and informants, and it was, it was complicated exactly who they were targeting, but they felt that it was threatening the fragile Jewish life after the destruction of the Second Temple, and they had to have this prayer. And they knew it had to be a very strong prayer, and the prayer says all those people should be uprooted and destroyed and so on. But they asked the most humble of all of their rabbis to write that prayer, Shmuel HaKatan, Shmuel the Small. Because only someone who was that humble could be trusted to write such a prayer, even when it was deemed necessary. It had the potential be, to be taken the wrong way. And the rabbis had so much to deal with, you know, people without a land, without a temple, a religion with little chance of survival. 
And more than anything, just a lot of people just needed help. And so they created a tradition where everything is understood in its proper context with human eyes and situations change. And the people that we denounce so powerfully in our minds and our hearts, perhaps they're not the same as we really think they are. In our Parsha this week, we have so much, some of the most virul, virul, virulent condemnations in the Torah of idol worship. What will happen to idol worshipers and those who even think of idol worship? Fire and brimstone, as mentioned earlier, very harsh, rooted out. And one can read those verses and think, well, they apply to present-day conditions. They apply to people in our days who are not following the religious path that we think. But it's not the same. As Rav Cook was saying, the idol worship of the Torah, that was something very specific. We need to have some understanding. The idol worship in the Torah was throwing babies into the fire for Moloch, orgies for the gods. It's very different than secular people not following the mitzvot or even other religions having a statue of a god. And that there was some specific low hypnotic power that we see in the story of the golden calf to the idolatry and the way people related to it in those days that would take entire people to a place of being immoral and bringing in evil very quickly. Right. The priests of the priests of Baal used to play the drums and cut themselves to go into a frenzy. And so it's so powerful that okay, the Torah had to be very strong about this. And it had to be very powerful in its directive. But we live in a different world, and we need to look at the world from that place. So even many rabbis later on, when they were asked, well, is what other religions doing, is it idolatry? Well, even in medieval times, the Meiri and others said, well. If you go to a Catholic church, those are not idols. They're helping Christians reach their vision of God. It's not, they don't believe it's God itself. And others have said the same about Hinduism. And that what major world religions are doing today is not the idolatry of the Torah. And so not being fanatic is taking a second look and trying to understand why it's different than we may believe and not seeing in extremes. And the same parsha that warns against idolatry in such dire terms also speaks about bringing everybody together, from the elders to the youth, the women, the children, everybody is brought in. So it's easy to be zealous about the positions that we care about and are important to our hearts. But there is also perhaps a place where that too can become idolatry. And having some compassion and understanding can be more challenging. And during this period, right, tonight is Slichot, we begin the process of asking for forgiveness. And so we ask for forgiveness for the many ways we hurt others and transgress from being our own best selves. And one way is how we, by how we judge others and we think about them and allow that fanaticism to grow in our own hearts and minds. And it takes courage and inner strength to say, what they're doing is maybe not as bad as I thought. I don't need to be polemical. We can find understanding and maybe even a place of mutual agreement where we can do our best to see the good. And there are also times where we have to take the strong positions, but then we should try and do it as Shmuel HaKatan in the spirit of the humblest of the rabbis who had to write the prayer about the informants. And as the Baal Shem Tov says, when we judge another person for something horrible that they're doing, if we didn't have a little bit of that with them ourselves, we wouldn't even be able to see it in them. And so the moment we are judging them, we're really judging ourselves. As he says, God is our shadow. When we judge them for something they're doing, immediately we get judged by the universe. But if we find the place, the place of thoughtful assessment and compassionate assessment of others, we too will live in that same place ourselves and receive that same measured divine justice and peace in the world will come to a little bit more unity and understanding. Shabbat Shalom.